Sairam, we are here at Prashanti Nilayam, Puda Park in South India, with some very distinguished guests. To my immediate left is Dr. S. Bhagavanta, eminent scientist, physicist, a translator for Bhagavan Sri Satya Sai Baba, also a trustee for the Satya Sai Central Trust. To his left, Mr. Howard Murphy from Australia, author of two books on the life of Satya Sai Baba, Sai Baba Man of Miracles and Sai Baba Avatar. To his left, Mr. Larry Smith from the University of San Diego. He's a director on the Council of Americas, such as Sai Baba organizations. And to his left, Dr. Sam Sandweiss, author of the book Sai Baba, Holy Man and the Psychiatrist. He's also a director on the Council of the Americas. And from San Francisco, Mr. Don Heath, also a director of the Council of the Americas. Dr. Bhagavantam, if we could start with you, if you could tell us a little bit of how and when you came to Sri Satya Sai Baba. I came to Satya Sai Baba now 20 years ago, so that it's more archaeology rather than history. And I came to him at a time when I was very active in my scientific career, more with the curiosity to know what Satya Sai Baba is, what he does, and can we have a rational explanation for Satya Sai Baba's actions. This was the motivation with which I first came to Satya Sai Baba 20 years ago. But I must hasten to say that things have changed so much since then that I am no longer foolish to ask such questions. I have had many opportunities of finding my own answers to these questions and Satya Sai Baba has been most generous in the early years when I had doubts to go out of his way to clear all those doubts. Now I have no doubts and he does not try to clear those doubts. That is the present position. In the 20 years that you've been with Sai Baba, can you describe some of the changes in your life? In my life, oh, I look back and I cannot recognize what I was. There's so much change. I came to Satya Sai Baba as a very proud man, as a scientist who believed that there is nothing in this world which science cannot explain, and there is no room for God at all in this world, and that man can manage their own affairs. In a way, I was a very conceited person, very proud of various things, of my scientific knowledge, of my ability to speak and expound in the English language, and so on, many things. Today, I have come to learn that my knowledge of science is nothing. My knowledge of English is nothing. And in fact, all my abilities, of which I was proud of, have left me and I am a much better, much saner and more humble person today. This is the biggest change which has come in me. Being a scientist, the gap between objective knowledge as accumulated by science and the miracles of such a Sai Baba might, must have posed some kind of difficulty for you. How did you bridge that gap? Indeed, uh, science has done many great things, has done several things, but it deals with the world, with the material world, and in dealing with the material world, it uses our five senses, so the sense of vision, the sense of hearing, the sense of touch. These are the five senses that we use in understanding the material world with the help of science. True, we have discovered many 
instruments which help these senses. Ultimately, we must use our eye, we must use our ear, we must use our touch. Whereas, in matters that interest Sat Sai Baba, the material world is of no importance at all. It takes a secondary place. In fact, he plays it down so much that gradually I learned that the importance we give to the material world is not of any significance. There is something beyond the material world. Therefore, there is something beyond science which we should know and understand if we really want to know what the nature of human life is and what this world consists of in essence. Dr. Bhattam, you were also a translator for uh, Sri Satya Sai Baba. In your experience in translating for Baba, could you tell us maybe some small stories relating his grasp of various languages and your own? Well, I have had some of the most shattering moments while translating Baba. As I told you, I used to feel quite proud of my knowledge of the English language. Whereas perhaps all of you sitting here know that Baba's schooling has been practically nil. He has not even reached the high school stage. And as we commonly understand, he has not learned English at all. And when I stand next to him on the platform, I can notice that he is working out his own speech. He is carefully following my translation to see if that is correct, not only correct, if that is apt. In addition to that, he is ever ready to supply a word or a sentence if I am not able to get it at the right time. There have been many instances where I wonder how and where from does Baba get this knowledge of the English language? He has not been in a school. Now this is one of the most difficult things for any scientist to explain. Here is a man who has not gone to school, who is giving a discourse in a language other than English. Here I am with 40 years of experience of speaking English, teaching in English, translating and making a mistake and being corrected immediately on the spot by Baba and giving me the correct word in English language. Now this transcends all scientific explanation and rational thought. There have been stories of Baba talking to various devotees in various world languages. Can you relate any of these stories to us firsthand? Yes, there are many. <clears throat> I could perhaps just to save time pick up one or two. Many years ago, perhaps 15 years now, I had the pleasure of ushering in a Japanese geologist uh, into Baba's room. He knew very little English. He could speak only Japanese and some broken words in English. He was a colleague of mine. He was teaching geology for a short while in one of the universities in India. He went in to see Baba. Baba didn't want any of us inside for interpreting. And they were both closed for half an hour. What Baba spoke to him, in what language, I do not know. But this Japanese, when he came out, he was in tears. And I asked him, what is it? What has happened? And the man would simply break down and say, please leave me alone. I will talk to you later. And Baba has told me something about my life, which I thought that even my wife does not know. This was something which only my mother knew what happened to me when I was a young baby. And later I learned from him that he was what is called a blue baby. That is, he was born uh, prematurely. And he had a weak heart. This 
His family members do not know. His mother knew it because she brought up the blue baby. And Baba told him this story. Told him in what language, I do not know. And he gave this Japanese professor a small locket which was looking like the human heart with Baba's picture on it and said, you still have a big heart. Nobody knows this except your mother. You better wear this locket on you near your heart and you will be well, you will be protected. This man with tears narrated this story to me and said that Baba spoke to him in his own language and he was very grateful that he has given him protection from this weak heart. This is one instance of where surely the communication must have been in some language other than English. And when I asked Baba later how he spoke to this Japanese, it was a characteristic reply that he said, Oh, you need a language. I don't need a language. I speak from my heart to his heart. I don't need a language. My speech is from heart to heart. You people need a language. This was, be that as it may, a more recent incident I would like to mention here. This was when the wife of the president of Mexico visited us here in Prasantinale. She came, came to Delhi and she made very special arrangements. She was a guest of the Indian government and she came to Bangalore and she drove to Prasantinalayam with a view to have an audience with Baba. I had early information and I was waiting to interpret if necessary between Baba and this lady who was the wife of the President of Mexico. She did not know a word of English. She brought with her the Mexican ambassador in India to be able to help smoothen out things and translate and so on. I quickly learned that the ambassador does not know much English. And the lady did not know any English. The visit was arranged in Baba's room and I told Baba that uh, this lady is coming and she doesn't seem to know English. And she made a special request to me that in the room, besides Baba, she would not like anyone else other than herself, her ambassador and me to be present because she had some personal matters to put to Baba and ask for his grace. There were two daughters suffers with her. I had to ask her, does it mean that I have to keep your daughters also outside the room? She said, yes, please, if you can, don't allow my daughters also to come into the room. Now, this was a tough task entrusted to me. Everybody was kept outside. I went in, this lady went in, and the ambassador was inside. And I was trying to go up to Baba's room to tell him what the position was. But within seconds, Baba came down the steps without giving me a chance to explain the position. And Baba quickly turned to the ambassador and asked him, can you speak English? The ambassador struggled and said, a little. Baba turned to this lady, wife of the Mexican president, and asked her, can you speak English? These are the words used by Baba. She said, she repeated what the ambassador said, a little. Baba turned to me and said, Bhagavantam, you go out of the room, we don't need you now. I came out of the room and closed the door. The ambassador and uh, this lady and Baba were in the room for 45 minutes. Surely one cannot spend 45 minutes without talking. What they spoke 
In what language they spoke, I do not know. When the ambassador and the lady came out, I asked the ambassador, may I ask if uh, the madam is happy, if Baba has cleared her doubts? The ambassador said, yes, exceedingly happy. She is very happy. And she also turned to me and uh, she made some gestures and she said she was exceedingly happy. We saw them off. They left. I took the earliest opportunity that evening to ask Baba, Swami, in what language did you speak to this lady? You were in the room for 45 minutes. He wouldn't answer that question. He said, oh, I spoke to her. I told her all about her troubles. I told her that she had an accident five years ago and that she is suffering from the consequences of that accident. I gave her uh, some token, ring or whatever it is, and she was exceedingly happy. I repeated, Swami, in what language did you speak to her? He would not answer that question. I spoke to her. I told her everything about what she wanted. Did you not ask her if she was happy? What reply did she give you? I said, yes, Swami. She said she was exceedingly happy. Obviously you spoke to her, but what I want to know is in what language did you speak to her? Baba said, don't worry. I speak in the language of the heart. You need Spanish, you need English. I don't need a language. Well, uh, there are many other instances, but I think we should give a chance to others to come into the picture. Thank you, Dr. Bhagavanta. Howard Murphy is the author of two books on Sai Baba, Sai Baba Man of Miracles and Sai Baba Avatar. Many, many people have come to Sai Baba and his teachings because of uh, Mr. Murphy's books. Mr. Murphy, how did you first come to hear of and know about such a Sai Baba? Uh, it was in 1965, early 1965. I had come to India to stay at the Theosophical Society to study there. They had a course, a six months course there on uh, Sanatana Dharma or the ancient wisdom. And uh, at the end of that course, I was planning with my wife to travel around India. My first visit here, that was uh, end of 64. And uh, we were going to uh, traveled to visit as many uh, ashrams and Indian teachers that we could find. I was going to be the Paul Brunton of the 1960s, you see. I thought that was my idea, to write a book about uh, the secret India of that, that period. Paul Brunton wrote about the 1930s. Uh, well, at uh, this uh, study school of the ancient wisdom, there was an Indian who travelled around a lot and he uh, gave me a list of uh, places to go to uh, he thought of interest. And among them was one, uh, he mentioned Sai Baba of Puttapati. And he said, uh, difficult to get there, I've never been there. You have to do part of the journey by a bullet car. Uh, so I've never been, but he said, I understand he, he has uh, phenomena, which is the way the theosophists express supernormal powers for miracles, which interested me greatly in him. Uh, so I, I certainly planned to go and see him as soon as I could, bullet cart or not. Uh, because I've never seen actually a demonstration of uh, yogic powers. And uh, it seemed to me that if one could see somebody who really had those powers, it, it demonstrated the truth of the powers, that man can reach that level as taught by Patanjali and the great yogis of India. And of course, when I heard of Sai Baba, I didn't think in terms of avatar. At all. I 
thought, well, he must be a very great yogi or a great saint, which perhaps means much the same thing here. At any rate, uh, before I uh, could come to Puttaparthi, the Swami came to me, in a sense. But he came to Madras in about uh, February or March. I've forgotten, I've forgotten what month, month, in early 1965. And uh, he was staying at a the house there, and, and in a strange way, I heard about him. One of those who came with him was uh, an American woman who had taken sannyas with Shiva, the great Shiva Nanda. And uh, she was in uh, Swami's party of about half a dozen Western people and the rest Indians who, who came to Madras with him from here, from the party. She came down to the Theosophical Society estate uh, to look around. She was looking for some quiet place for meditation. And there I was introduced to her. And she told us about many of the strange things that had happened in the time she was with Swami. And uh, I was extremely interested in the, in the things she'd actually seen in Boone. And so uh, I travelled over to the house where he was living in Madras, where he was staying in Madras. I think I've written about this, so I'm really repeating things that are written in the early part of Man of Miracles. So I won't go into the details of how I met him, but uh, it was at that house that I met him. And he uh, gave me the, the address of his ashram here and uh, showed a little then of his power of knowing what's going on in the mind, which I've found since he has done many times in my experience, knowing what I'm thinking or saying in different parts of the world. I don't have to be here, but at that, uh, on that morning, uh, I was uh, asking uh, somebody in the room to give me the exact address of uh, Baba's ashram, Puttaparthi. And before uh, this uh, lady, a Swiss lady in the room, could do so, he came in with a group of the men, and so the conversation stopped, of course, there, and I didn't get the address. And then he called my wife and I into a, a room, and uh, he produced some Vibhuti for my wife, because she was not too well at the time. And he turned to me, and he waved his hand, and I thought he was going to give me some more Vibhuti, but he produced a little photograph of himself very small, with the address of the ashram printed on it. And he said, you were asking for my address. He said, and handed it to me. You keep it in your wallet. As a matter of fact, that's uh, what, 18 years ago, it's still in my wallet, that same little photograph. And I said, may I come there sometime, brother? And he said, it's your home, come any time. That was my first introduction. In your involvement with Theosophy, uh, how has uh, Sai Baba uh, entered into that field of knowledge? How has he, his teaching either conflicted or agreed with the Theosophical teaching? Uh, it's uh, an expansion of it. It certainly agrees with it because, uh, uh, well, as you know, he. Uh, he teaches the universality of religion, the truth in all religions, which is, is uh, one of the uh, teachings of theosophy. Uh, and so in that respect, uh, he's completely in line with uh, the theosophical teachings. Uh, as you probably know, theosophy believes in the brotherhood of man and uh, in uh, a study of comparative religion, philosophy, of science, and in uh, also in the, the study of the potential powers in man and nature. So, Swami demonstrate the demonstrates the potential powers 
interesting man in nature, and he uh, he certainly uh, teaches the brotherhood of man, not only teaches it, but inspires it. And he very much in, uh, inspires and uh, leads us to the heart of all religions, where he has now a gathering, uh, a, a following of uh, of the Muslims. I met one only yesterday, and then I had a talk. Uh, and he's recently built a mosque in Purukati. In his earlier life, he had many uh, Muslim followers. In this life, he hasn't yet got many, but they are coming to him more and more, and Parsis, and I don't think there are any religions that are not represented in his following. Actually, what he is, as far as my, my own personal experience is concerned, I must say, the thing he's brought, which theosophy cannot give, the, theosophy is um, of the mind mainly, you see. It's, a, it's something uh, you come to terms with mentally, and there's no, um, no heart in it, in that there's no devotional quality in theosophy. In the early, uh, among the early founders of theosophy, there was that devotion, but not to the extent that we get it through following Sai Baba. And when, uh, when I was in, uh, had part of the instruction of my first course there was in uh, Patanjali, no, uh, Narada's Bhakti Sutras. And the wonderful old teacher by the name of Dr. Timely, since dead, was trying to um, to um, discuss Narada's Bhakti Sutras, and as far as I was concerned, they were practically meaningless. Because without the inspiration of some great figure to uh, to uh, create divine love within you, it's not much use talking about the theory of divine love. And so I, I, I left me cold. I was not the slightest bit interested in Bhakti yoga at that time, but. Swami has changed all that, and in changing that and bringing that inspiration of love and devotion, he of course has changed, changed my whole outlook on life. While well, we're on the subject of divine love and devotion, Dr. Sam Sandweiss, most of us are familiar with, has uh, written a very, very popular book, Sai Baba, The Holy Man and the Psychiatrist. And in your book, Dr. Sandweiss, you describe in your chapter in Psychiatry a new element that Sai Baba has added to your scope of human nature, that of divine love. Can you tell us a little bit of how that's affected your work back in the United States? Well, um, firstly, uh, the, the way I, let me start by uh, speaking a little bit about the way I came to know about Baba, um, because it was through, um, my interest in what brings people peace of mind and um, uh, sense of stability and uh, feeling of um, protection and um, the elimination of emotional mental worries. And uh, after I had uh, treated an awful lot of people and gone through my own uh, treatment um, in the process of my uh, education, I came to the point where I still was uh, up against the basic questions about um, what the universe is all about and um, uh, who am I in this small little body being here in this immense universe and uh, uh, in this period of time which is just a speck of time in all eternity. And uh, some of the major spiritual questions uh, weren't answered and were still troubling. And I could see that uh, psychiatry uh, just hadn't uh, filled the bill. And there are a lot of people who are in psychotherapy, and there are a lot of therapists uh, who are struggling with um, the issues of peace and safety in the universe. And uh, I came to the feeling that um, I had heard a lot of people talking about some interesting uh, theories and practices, but that uh, I got to a place where it just was going round and round and round, where people were saying similar kinds of things, and I was looking around for a master amongst psychotherapists, and I just couldn't find one. So I wondered who really to trust. And I got to the point where I was wondering, could anybody really uh, answer some of the real pressing questions about uh, the nature of our being? 
And uh, I remember asking the question, uh, have you ever seen a miracle? I began asking my psychotherapist, who was scratched his head. And um, it was right at the end of my psychotherapy because I could see I was doing, I was just going around kind of uh, in circles with it. And um, when I was dealing with patients also, uh, there, there wasn't the, the final end where a person leaves contented, yes, you know. Um, people got over certain crises and situations and they felt better emotionally, but that real yes about the safety, the understanding, the feeling of one's place in the universe, that sense of really being loved and uh, that there is really a connection and that there is really a sense of um, uh, relatedness to the father, to the, to the parent. Well, that was absent. Uh, and it wasn't very long after uh, I began asking this question that I heard about the Sacha Sai Baba. Uh, the question is, is there anybody who's really at a different level of consciousness that um, uh, understands the meaning of the world more than psychotherapists? And all of a sudden I heard of uh, Sacha Sai Baba, who a yes could demonstrate miracle, and yes it was a sign that uh, he understood something that was beyond uh, the, the realm of the emotions of the mind, where most psychiatrists uh, dealing. And I was initially attracted just to see if I could, uh, could see a miracle. Something in the material universe uh, being created uh, that wasn't up to sleep, evidently by divine will or by uh, thought or whatever. And I came to India, and I don't know the process, uh, but he wore me down to a frazzle. I, I, I wanted to see the miracle right off the bat. And uh, most people that come to Baba initially feel have some kind of fantasy that he's going to take him in and say, I knew you all your life and your name is this and you're the, uh, you wanted this from me and I'm going to give you this and I'm going to show you the entire world and I'm going to show you myself and my divine form and all that. But uh, he didn't do that to me and he does that to very few uh, devotees. He made me sit and wait and get angry with them and get frustrated and think that I was crazy for coming all this way and then all of a sudden uh, you know, it's, uh, it's hard to appreciate if, you, if the experience isn't yours, but all of a sudden, in the moment of the most pain, uh, he came to me like the sweetest parent, like a divine parent. Um, and what he gave me on a material level was a piece of candy, but uh, he showed me in, in the most intense period of my pain uh, that he was sweeter than, than the sweetest and that he uh, understood me entirely, that he was uh, actually omnipresent. He understood my thoughts, he understood my pain, and not only understood it, he responded. It was an immense uh, revelation to me, omnipresence, omniscience, and a sweetness of love that uh, one can't describe. And um, it's that love, uh, that love that isn't worldly, that wants nothing in return, uh, that love uh, which, um, uh, in which he feels closer to you than the closest person, uh, that love uh, certainly healed me and made me feel, aha, this is the answer. How to get that love? How to get it from him? How to get it from myself? How to find a love that transcends uh, earthly love? So uh, it became uh, my experience now that there really is a path to um, this kind of love. For me right now, it's through Satya Sai Baba. And um, after I got over the hurdle of wanting to see my little miracle, uh, he showed me that it's through the process of devotion uh, that this love is uh, cultivated. And it's this element of God and this element of devotion that uh, has to be uh, incorporated into psychotherapy to make it anything. Because uh, like Dr. Bhagavantam was saying, uh, his uh, science, he was, he was competent as a scientist and as a speaker, and now he knows that that is nothing. Uh, psychotherapy, um, uh, some psychotherapists talk a, a real interesting game and do some fancy gyrations, and people look like they're getting better for a brief period of time, and they're all kinds of fads. But um, uh, I came to... Uh, to know from my direct experience with Satya Sai that that's like playing in a bathtub compared to uh, the ocean. And the path to eternal bliss and eternal love, what do I know about that? Uh, I, I have a, a deep conviction that uh, it's through Satya Sai, what Satya Sai represents. It's um, 
All one has to do is get close to side to side and have oneself open and take a look at that smile. And you know that you're by the ocean and you want the, the ocean. And uh, he says, uh, the ocean is gained through devotion. Develop a relationship to God. Bring God into psychotherapy. Bring devotion into psychotherapy. Now I, I can see it's, the, it's going to be the um, purpose of my life to try to get those elements, this, this basic message into uh, my practice and to try to share that with colleagues. Um, it's a very, very surprising situation uh, in modern day psychotherapy that very, very few people talk about God and about devotion. And when I try to talk about it with uh, uh, psychiatric colleagues, um, I see their fingers tapping and their legs jumping around and they're making snickers. And um, it's a wonderful time to be here on earth with Sachi Sai where, uh, where he's not understood, not known, because then you can talk about him all day long. Uh, it gives you a great, uh, it gives you a great chance to talk about him because not many people know, so you can talk about devotion to God all day long. And even though there are there are taps of the fingers and, and shakings of the feet. So many people are crying out for this great light and uh, for this great direction. Along with Dr. Samwise, uh, Larry Smith and Don Heath are directors of the Council of the Americas. Um, if the three of you, separately of course, uh, would care to comment on the kind of reaction that's happening in the United States and uh, how Sai Baba's teachings are reaching people in the United States, and maybe some of your personal experiences with people who have contact with such a Sai. I think uh, when I came to know of Sai Baba in around 1971, I might be a good example of a bad person, very confused, uh, looking for some sort of fulfillment in a very outer directed way. Uh, this was a time of great social change in America and I think I came through all the typical institutions and was a student of that era and was very confused uh, with the Vietnam War and various things of that nature. Uh, I think I reached a culmination of trying to be fu fulfilled with this outer sensory uh, directed way and couldn't find it. And I was sick to death of myself, I believe. And so at that point, I began to say, hey, is there something besides what I know? Is there something greater, something deeper, something more inner, more fulfilling? I cannot be fulfilled by this outer experience that I'm having. And so I began to do some reading and some research and study comparative religions. Uh, I was very fortunate to come in contact with a, a lady who was very well versed in Eastern philosophy. And my wife and myself and a few friends began to study with this person. And she had never heard of uh, Satya Sai Baba at the time. But going on a, a holy pilgrimage to India, she, by Swami's uh, workings, I'm sure, found her way to uh, some sort of festival that was going on at the time in 1971. And he, she was very ill at the time, extremely ill. In fact, uh, she ended up in the hospital for several weeks in India. And when she was at this festival, Swami came directly to her. There were like something like 20,000 people present. And he called her in for a personal interview, uh, gave her much insight into her own problems and why she was ill and told her when she would be well and uh, within the interview she being a very sensitive person realized that here was a person beyond uh, any experience she had ever had and she's well versed in like I said various philosophies and teachings. Well she came back and told us about uh, Satya Sai Baba and we immediately took to it for some unknown, unknown reason myself and my wife in particular and we began to try to find out more about Sai Baba. And Dr. Gokok came to America, I believe it was in 1974, and he traveled around and spoke in San Diego, where we live, and in Laguna Beach. And we were very, very interested, my wife, myself, and several friends. And so we went to every place that he spoke, even though he was saying basically the same things. 
And upon uh, returning from the, the Laguna Beach uh, lecture, my wife, well, while we were there, my wife purchased a very small photograph that someone had of Swami. And she had never seen it before, and none of the other group that was with us knew that she had purchased it. So we were coming home in the car, and we remembered that uh, one of the girls, who's a friend of ours, had stayed home to watch the children. So she, my wife decided that, well, perhaps she should give this photo to this girl who was watching the children for thanks. And so she wrote a little message on the back. We uh, returned home. She gave the photograph to the girl. And several moments later, my son requested uh, for my wife to take him to the restroom because the light was burned out. He wanted to go to bed, brush his teeth. Well, this is a little bit funny, this whole story, but uh, it really happened. My wife opens the medicine cabinet, and the identical photograph that she had just purchased of Swami was standing right on the toothbrush that my son had requested my wife to get because the light was burnt out in the restroom. And no one else had even been in, in there. And it's in our own home, and we're very close to the people who went with us. And surely they wouldn't uh, try to confuse us like this. So needless to say, uh, this caused a great deal of commotion because we had been hearing uh, various things that Swami was saying about um, uh, truth and, well, I guess I should say various things that people had said about Swami's miracles and the things that were occurring around him daily. Perhaps I wouldn't have even believed it if things like this hadn't have happened uh, to many other people uh, who are getting acquainted with Satya Sai Baba. And that sort of started us off with a, a bang, so to speak, and we really uh, dove into it after that. Don, you've brought many people here to see uh, Satya Sai Baba. Some people who have been here a number of times and many, many new faces. Uh, you must have experienced many transformations in other people's lives, of course, uh, besides the transformation in your own life. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Well, to me, I think the greatest miracle our beloved does is the transformation of the personalities, the, the lives of the different people that come here. And they certainly come from all walks of life. I've been here, this is my ninth trip, and I've seen people from every country. And you are right, I have brought uh, many seekers, let's say, to Baba. It's been very joyous to watch people change. Um, a great experience for me was on my eighth trip, I was fortunate to bring my mother and father. And I think I can only say that our beloved came to me, and I think it began probably 30, 35 years ago. I was raised in the Roman Catholic religion, and as a young lad, I was an altar boy, and I can remember praying to Jesus and believing at that time, if Jesus had come, I couldn't see why another great master or being couldn't come. Well, that didn't cut very good ice with the nuns that were teaching me. And we had many arguments at the age of eight, nine, and ten. But I certainly believe that. After I graduated from high school, I came to California because, as history has proven, when people are searching, they start moving west. And I was raised in Rhode Island, and I came to California in search of a, I guess I was looking for a new life. Up until 1971, I can truthfully say I didn't know what I was looking for. I can say now that I was looking for love, and I didn't understand what love was all about. I didn't understand the word to me. Being from the West, it meant various forms of pleasure. I tried to find it in drugs.
LSD, all the drugs of the late 60s and early 70s. But often I would think of the Lord and I would say, I know you can come again because by then I had also started reading comparative religions. And I read where the Buddha had come and Krishna had came. So I started praying for that because I used to wake up in the morning after a hangover from too many martinis or smoking too much ganja, which people do all over the world now. And I'd wake up with a big void in my life. So I started asking, who am I? What is life all about? And at that time I met a lady who used to bring many groups before I long before I started bringing groups here, and that was Madhaji Indra Devi. She came to San Francisco in 1971, and it was on Baba's birthday. And uh, in my search, I just happened to be present when she spoke and be at Baba's celebration. And right away in my heart, something clicked. And the clicking keeps continuing because, as Swami says, the relationship between the Lord and His child is a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. There are no in-betweens. And before really finding out about Baba, I could say I was a guru hapa. I used to visit all different ashrams. I came to India twice before I ever heard of Sai Baba. I visited many of the teachers here, but they always seemed to want money. It seemed like they were on a tremendous ego trips, and they just didn't melt my heart at all. And then when I heard Indra Devi talk about Sai Baba, I said, I think I've found what I was looking for. In 1973, I had the opportunity to come here, and I can't say it was easy, it was very difficult coming. I tried to come in 71, I tried to come in 72, and I finally made it, my first trip to Baba in 1973. Um, the transformation in myself is what brought my mother and father here on my last trip. They just said, well, whatever you're doing must be pretty good, and maybe we could go with you. But I used to wonder, well, how are they ever going to go with me? They, they don't have that kind of money to spend, to, it's like a thousand dollars each round trip. So I mentioned it to Swami on my seventh trip. I said, Swami, I think my mother and father want to come. And he sweetly looked and he said, yes, yes, they're coming on your next trip. I'm taking very good care of them. But when I returned to San Francisco, there were many message, phone messages from my mother. And uh, I finally called immediately and she was just ecstatic. She, and it, it proves to be the same day that Baba was telling me he was going to take very good care of them, that they won a state lottery, the Rhode Island State Lottery, for $10,000. So when I said, Swami said you were to come for the Dasara Festival, there was never an, a question about coming. They came, Swami showered them with lots of grace and love, and my mother says what I've been saying. She finally met true love. I would like to ask uh, this nice group of uh, Sai brothers uh, a question uh, that might relate, uh, have some meaning to uh, the people in the U.S. Uh, and that is that um, uh, there are a lot of uh, people who are searching now on the spiritual path, and um, they're into so many different paths. Uh, there are all kinds of people who say that uh, they're demonstrating phenomena, uh, healings and evangelists and psychosurgeons and aura uh, transformers and all kinds of things going on. Um, how are we to understand uh, Sai Baba and what Sai Baba means? Uh, is there something special about him? You know, uh, our, our beloved Lord, as Don uh, describes him and uh, defines him, 
um, tells us that uh, he is no better uh, than, uh, than anybody else, that he is our servant, that he in fact is a reflection of us, that uh, we shouldn't uh, be taken up with uh, trying to compare him and put down anybody else. Uh, and he's not interested in us proselytizing. But it, there seems to be uh, something so special about the Satya Sai that uh, I'm wondering if we can get uh, some of the thoughts uh, of the people here uh, of uh, the, the really fantastic uh, miracle and um, phenomenon that's happening in the form of Satya Sai now. He's so unusual, and it, uh, that, that, I, I think that point uh, has to be made in some way. I think uh, myself, one of the great differences, as I just said earlier, in the search and meeting other gurus, when I came to Baba, his hand was always in this fashion, in a giving fashion. It was never like this, like many of the other teachers, in a taking fashion. It's a great pity, not sandwise, that so many people go to a country like the United States and talk of transformation, talk of spiritual paths and give so much hope to several individuals. Ultimately, the hope will simply shatter when you go into detail. In fact, Baba often mentions this and I have had the courage to ask him, why don't you go to the United States? Because several people want you there and you tell them that you will go next March, next March. Why don't you do it? His reply is, so many people who really are not of the same level as I am or as a divine person should be, go there and they give such a wrong picture that I don't want to get mixed up with all these people. The point I want to make is, he is very, very different. There is no comparison uh, in whatever angle you look at between the so-called gurus and the so-called leaders who generally go outside India and who begin to pretend to teach spiritual path to many of the Westerners. I think if you ask me, the greatest point has been made by Don when he said, so far as Sai Baba is concerned, his hand is always like that. Whereas every other guru, every other institution in India, you will find the hand is like this. I deliberately mentioned the trust in the beginning because even today if someone wants to give out of his own free will some money for some good act, nothing can be done in this world without money. But Sai Baba is very clear. He says, yes, there is a trust. Give it to the trust. And they deal with the worldly matters. They run schools. They feed the poor children. Give it to the trust and he owns nothing, he takes nothing, and it's impossible to give to Sai Baba as an individual any gift in any form. Try as you may. I have tried several times. Yes, if you press, if you are close to him, he will say, good, Bangaru, give it to the trust, and the trust will manage it, or will mismanage it, whatever it is. The whole thing is on us and not on Baba. This you will not find in any other guru. He keeps on saying, I don't want dollars. All these chaps who are going to the United States in the name of gurus, they are going there to collect dollars. I don't want to get mixed up. This is the main reason why he does not want to go to the United States at present. But there are other things if you wish me to say something about uh, how Baba is different from others. I keep on telling the Indian groups to whom I talk quite often. Excuse me, let's... Uh, we were on the question which uh, Dr. Sandweiss raised. How are we to make out what is real, what is not real, when many people come and talk of spiritual path, talk of transformation, talk of one miracle or another? Yes, that's a very good question, I said because, and in fact the answer was given in very sharp terms 
by Don when he said, so far as Sat Sai Baba is concerned, his hand is always turned upside down. Whereas most of the gurus have their hand turned so as to receive. Sat Sai Baba always gives and never receives. Whether it is a gift or whether it is grace or whether it is love, he gives, he never receives. Whereas gurus keep on asking and keep on getting various gifts from people who come to them. This is the biggest difference. And I was mentioning my own experience of asking Sat Sai Baba why he does not go to the United States. He is quite knowledgeable of the fact that many people from the East go to Western countries and talk of spiritual path and incidentally, they only make money, they earn dollars. So, Baba being very different, he says, I don't want to get mixed up with such people. It's likely that in their ignorance, they will think that I am also one of them. So I don't want to go to a country where such confusion exists. I was trying to make out that there are many ways in which you can see the clear difference between Sati Sai Baba and Gurus. Whenever I talk to the Indian groups, I tell them it will be a good sadhana if each one of you can ask yourself the question in your experience, in what way do you find Sati Sai Baba to be different from others with whom you come in contact. I tell this to my young Indian friends. It will be a good introspection and sadhana if you ask this question, why have I come to Baba? Why do I stick with Baba? What is the difference between Baba and ABC, so many other gurus, India is full of various people who claim to do several things. What is the difference? Why do I stick here? If you make this self-analysis and introspection, it will be a good sadhana and it will strengthen your own faith if you can get the right answers to this question. I tell my Indian friends to go through this process. I have gone through this process myself. The question of receiving or giving, in my opinion, is a very minor matter. There are at least half a dozen other instances where we can distinguish Sati Sai Baba from all others. He never asks anyone to do something which he does not do himself. My life is my message. He never prescribes before he practices. I am sure most of you know this, but uh, some of us who are closely moving with him see him in action morning till evening, we know that he never preaches unless he himself practices it. If he says, love thy neighbor, a thousand people in India keep on saying, love thy neighbor. It's a very old statement coming from the time of Jesus Christ. But 999 people hate the neighbor in practice. Say, love your neighbor in preaching. You won't find it in Baba. When Baba says, love all human beings, he loves all human beings, in fact. And we know it, uh, because those of us who are close to him see that he loves his worst enemy. As well, by enemy I meant one who abuses him. as deeply and as well as he loves a devotee. I like to narrate an incident here in, in, in this connection. There used to be a newspaper in Bombay. Uh, I don't have to mention the name. The editor was particularly inimical to Baba. He did not believe in his divinity. Not only did he not believe in his divinity, he was writing uh, slander. I don't know if that is the right English word. For instance, he made a statement in the newspaper that the food Baba eats is so rich that one meal 
is good enough to feed 20 hungry people. This was written in the newspaper in headlines. Well, I have my lunch and my dinner as long as I live here in Prashant Nilayam with Baba. And I know what he eats. I also know how rich is his food. At this age of mine, when I don't need food, much food, when I eat my lunch with Baba, I go starving. Because he eats so little, and uh, when Baba is eating so little, you don't expect me to gulp too much food. In that context, when I see the headline in the newspaper that the food which Baba eats is so rich that it can feed 20 hungry people, this is a fantastic lie. He does not eat sweet. He does not touch butter. He does not touch curds. He does not take ghee. He doesn't touch sugar. He doesn't take milk. He doesn't take coffee. It's easier for me to tell you what he does not eat. He eats very little. Leave that. The same newspaper, the editor has written, Baba is always surrounded by women. Now, this is the biggest lie I have ever seen. I know that his own sister cannot enter the room. She stands outside until Baba comes out and speaks to her. She cannot enter his room. No woman can enter his room. Because later I inquired and I found that one reason for this is somebody mistook Mr. Kasturi for a woman. The name Kasturi in India is a woman's name as also a man's yeah. name. It is used for both. Somebody mistook that to be the name of a woman. Be that as it may, the newspaper writes that Baba is always surrounded by women. Now, another fantastic line. And so on, I will stop at that. The editor of this newspaper came to Bombay and wanted an interview with Baba. The word was taken to Baba by some of the volunteers. I was just standing by. And Baba said, yes, uh, I'll probably see him, but let him come and sit along with all the 10,000 devotees in the Pandal. And I pick up usually, I don't accept any such recommendations. I pick up people whom I wish to interview. And if I like, I will pick up this man as well. Let him go and sit there. The man was humble enough to go and sit with the crowd. I was watching uh, the whole drama because I knew that this is the editor of the newspaper which wrote on the front pages that Baba's food is very rich and that Baba is always surrounded by women. My reaction was that Baba is uh, just getting over a situation and he will probably not pick him up. Well, lo and behold, he picked him up. And uh, after half hour, I got a message that uh, Baba wants you urgently. I said, uh, yes, I will go. And I went running to Baba's room and found that there were only two people in the room. That is Baba and this editor of this newspaper was inside. And Baba was talking and I was to translate to this man. He didn't know Telugu. He knew only English and some other North Indian language. I started translating. Wondering within myself, how Baba is so gracious, so loving, and so generous to a man who I know has abused him and written fantastic lies about Baba. But it made no difference. Baba was exceedingly nice, spoke to him about his personal matters, and gave him vibhuti, and treated him, uh, if I may use that word, in a royal red carpet manner. 
I was jealous, I was envious, I thought Baba never treats me so kindly and here is this man getting such a royal treatment. I was red in my face, but uh, discipline required that I hide all my feelings, I translated and Baba gave him Vibhuti and the man went out. Baba looked at me and said, Bhagavantam, why are you so angry? I said, Swami, I am not angry. What makes you think that I am angry? I didn't. I thought I translated in the normal way. He said, no, I can see you. You are red in your face. You are very angry. I said, Swami, there is nothing which you do not know. Now that you mention it, I have to accept that indeed I am very much upset that you leave out 10,000 devotees who are sitting there and you pick up this man who has written in the newspapers that you are always surrounded by women, he has slandered you and you go out of your way and you pick him up and bring him into the room and you add insult to the injury, you call me to translate all that you are going to tell him. Yes, I am very much upset. Of course, I am nobody to advise you. But if I had my way, I would throw out this man from the window. I would call ten volunteers and kick him out of the window. I gave vent to all my venom. He smiles and says, yes, that is the difference between you and me. Yes, you are upset, I am not upset. You are angry, I am not angry. To me, whether he has abused me, or whether he has praised me, or whether he is my devotee, it makes no difference. That is the difference between you and me. You may go now. Now, I mention this to say that all of us repeat love every human being. Do good to one particularly who harms you. This is the kind of preaching which we all say. I have heard hundreds and thousands of gurus in India say this. Not one of them can treat a person who has abused him even a tenth of what that editor has abused Baba in the manner in which Baba has treated him. This is a striking difference. There are many people here who speak ill of him. Some of them trickle. I mean, you would not know it. There are several Indians whom I know who talk ill of him, who don't believe in him, who do not think that he is divine. They come and their past, some of us know that they are bad people. But to Baba, he is a human being. And in him there is God, as in me and as in you. No difference you can find when Baba showers love on him. In fact, we all feel upset. And when, when sometimes I ask him, when he permits me, Baba, you have shown so much generosity to him and you have done such grace to him, why is it? Not a tenth of it you show me. He says, Bhagavantam, he deserves it more. He wants it more. You don't need it. His need is more. Now look at that. This is the human side of Baba. You will not find another guru doing like this. I'm leaving aside the small matters of money and so on. They're really of no value at all. It is his compassion and it is his grace and it is his love under all circumstances that marks him out of all the gurus and all the spiritual paths. There are other things too, but I think this is the most outstanding feature. Love your enemy. He does it, he says it and he practices it. Apparently the world is witnessing a phenomenon that has been unparalleled for the past 2,000 years, the advent of divinity incarnating in man. We'd like to thank our special guests, Dr. S. Bhagavantam, Dr. Samuel Stanwise, Mr. Howard Murphy, Don Heath, and Larry Smith. We hope that this program will be of benefit to you. Sorry.